First of all, uh, good afternoon, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to present uh, our tutorial on trial-based economic evaluation. Uh, my name is uh, Hannah Brolika, and I'm postdoctoral researcher at uh, Health Technology Assessment uh, Section at Freie University Amsterdam. And the work I'm going to present is a joint project with uh, my colleagues, uh, Dr. Uh, Angela Yornada Ben, uh, Mohamed Alele, uh, Hanneke van Dongen, and Professor Judith Bosmans. So let me uh, start with a little background and uh, motivation for this work, perhaps, because as a person who worked uh, primarily on decision modeling studies, I was surprised uh, when I joined the health technology assessment uh, group and was asked to perform my first ever trial based economic evaluation. And there seemed to be significantly less guidance on how to perform trial-based economic evaluation in comparison to performing modeling-based uh, uh, evaluations. And uh, we might speculate why this is the case. Uh, perhaps it has something to do with the fact that the uh, challenges of trial-based economic evaluation are fragmented and uh, consist uh, of a series of uh, statistical complexities that are not necessarily related to each other. And uh, perhaps also people just find uh, modeling a bit more creative process. And then they also exert more effort to uh, make it yeah, transparent and increase its quality. Uh, but uh, in any case, uh, I have uh, brilliant colleagues uh, researching uh, methodology of uh, trial-based uh, economic evaluation who identified uh, six uh, statistical challenges uh, that threatened the quality of trial-based economic evaluation, which you can uh, read uh, on the slide. Uh, in fact, one of my colleagues uh, yesterday defended his thesis uh, on this topic. So if you are interested, I can recommend also this uh, book uh, yeah, for this topic. Uh, and um, I'm uh, quite happy that uh, I heard uh, many of uh, the speakers uh, today and also yesterday to speak of uh, some of uh, the yeah, statistical challenges and how they can be fixed. Because uh, in fact, uh, the reviews in the last decade uh, has, have shown that uh, indeed the quality of uh, the trial-based economic evaluations in the last decade uh, was uh, relatively poor. So I think that there is a space uh, for, uh, for improvement. And uh, the issue is uh, also that the challenges are not usually addressed by national pharmacoeconomic guidelines. So, uh, well, I can uh, tell from my experience from the Czech Republic, whereas we have quite relatively detailed guidance on how to uh, undergo uh, modeling uh, economic evaluation, there is uh, relatively little on how, how to do uh, trial-based economic evaluation. And this is further confirmed by work of my colleagues who reviewed about 40 uh, national guidelines uh, in a recent paper. And they indeed found that for the statistical challenges uh, identified on a the slide, there is uh, either nothing or relatively vague uh, guidance how to address uh, these challenges in the national guidelines. So following this finding, uh, we came up with an idea to write a tutorial uh, combining methodological background uh, with uh, R code demonstrating a proper way uh, how to evaluate uh, tri trials. And uh, we want to do this using the available packages. So the aim of our work is not to develop uh, an R package. It's um, mostly uh, to uh, show how uh, all those complexities can be addressed uh, within uh, existing uh, tools. And also uh, the ambition is further, not just to uh, help uh, HTA researchers to uh, conduct good quality trial-based economic evaluation easier, but also to uh, help other researchers in health sciences involved in trials. Because uh, well, one issue we uh, quite often face is uh, that uh, while this is the trial-based uh, economic evaluation is multidisciplinary work and we need to have on board also uh, other health uh, sciences researchers uh, who might not have any training in HDA or uh, are not uh, familiar with R. So uh, for us, the ambition is to be as user-friendly as possible to uh, show a worked example uh, alongside with uh, some methodological background uh, to help them uh, understand the, the process of uh, economic evaluation of trials. And in this presentation, I will show very simplified version 
of a hypothetical trial evaluation and focus on important aspects of uh, handling uh, baseline imbalances, missing data, correlated costs and effects, and uh, also skewed data. And uh, this is still very much a work in progress. So we aim to add uh, more complexity to our example to address also situations such as presence of uh, clustering in the data, which is what we heard also uh, about uh, earlier uh, today. And that's one of uh, the statistical challenges uh, in economic evaluation of trials. So uh, the trial-based uh, economic evaluation can be roughly divided uh, into these five steps. Uh, and the third step can be uh, indeed uh, replaced uh, with a different uh, type uh, of model for different situations, such as a multi-level uh, model or generalized linear model. So it depends uh, on the structure of the data. And uh, well, here uh, already we have uh, the sample data for uh, this presentation and for uh, our tutorial. So um, we have two uh, treatment arms, uh, each of uh, which uh, consists uh, of 150 patients. We have treatment and uh, control group. We have uh, some uh, covariates such as age, gender, education, smoking status, and comorbidity. Uh, the follow-up of this trial is one year. We have four measurements, so each me measurement follows three months uh, after the previous one. And uh, here we work with uh, total utility and costs for each measurement point. But uh, of note, uh, this is not usually the case, because with the raw data, uh, they are <laughs> quite uh, complex in a sense uh, that they are usually on the level filled out uh, by um, a physician or a patient. So usually we have uh, some uh, categories of uh, health uh, resource uh, utilization and also uh, quality of life is filled in uh, by domain of EQFIT or other questionnaire, or we have uh, disease uh, related uh, measures for effects. But here just uh, yeah, to simplify, uh, we work with uh, total utility and uh, costs for uh, each measurement point. What we further see is that there are uh, indeed some uh, missing data to be imputed. Specifically, uh, well, this data is incredibly complete uh, at baseline, uh, but uh, you see that uh, with the follow-up, uh, there is missing data for about uh, 10% uh, of cases. And uh, for imputation model, uh, we use MICE package that was so far uh, sufficient for uh, our purposes, but uh, we customize the prediction matrix. So one thing uh, to know about MICE, and uh, while most of you as uh, well, people working in the field probably know it, is that uh, MICE uh, by default, I think, uses all variables to pre uh, predict a missing value, but uh, this is not advisable. First of all, uh, it's not, uh, it doesn't make uh, much sense in many cases. And secondly, if you have raw data on uh, and needs to impute on low, uh, low level, then the problem is that you can uh, run into overspecification of the model. Uh, because uh, there is easily about yeah, 100 or even uh, more covariates if you don't specify your prediction matrix. Uh, there are some uh, variables that uh, have to be uh, included in the model. These are those that differ at baseline, those related to probability of missingness, uh, those associated with outcomes, and also the variables that um, uh, are also considered uh, in the model. All, all these needs to be in the imputation model. And here I show uh, yeah, a sample uh, prediction matrix. It's uh, quite easy to read because each row basically tells how the dependent variable, what is uh, the imputation model. So for instance, uh, the last row tells us uh, what are the predictors of uh, the uh, costs at time point four at the last uh, measurement. So we see that here uh, we use all uh, the uh, personal characteristics uh, as predictors uh, and also uh, utility uh, at uh, time point four. Uh, the general pattern here is that uh, the personal characteristics always uh, predict uh, the follow-up measurement points and uh, 
the measurement point of an outcome predicts uh, the second outcome at that uh, measurement point and both outcomes at the next uh, time point. So for instance, for costs at time point three, uh, these costs at time point three predict uh, utility at time point three and both costs and effects at time point four. But of course, there are methods uh, how, to, how to specify uh, the imputation model. And uh, why I wanted to uh, show you the prediction matrix is that this is a simple one, but uh, with uh, the raw data, the raw data are usually much more complex and uh, we found it uh, very useful to specify it outside uh, R in Excel because there you can use, uh, well, some features uh, such as uh, color, uh, color coding, etc. Uh, because uh, it can be very complex if you want to identify uh, well and specify all the patterns in the prediction matrix correctly. So we experience actually uh, some typos and issues specifying it uh, correctly without typos in R. And to illustrate this point, I want to uh, show you one of my recent uh, prediction uh, matrices uh, for uh, a study we conducted last year. And yeah, well, you can see that uh, this is quite complex and specifying this matrix in, in R, R might uh, be prone to typo. And on top of that, if you do something like this in Excel, you can uh, hang it on your wall as uh, some type of art once you're done with the study. So uh, to continue with uh, multiple imputation, uh, as I said, uh, we specify the prediction matrix. We also specify the method that's uh, possible and advisable in R in mice, because uh, mice uh, guesses uh, what is the best method, whether predictive uh, mean matching or something else. But uh, it's advisable to check what method it guessed and whether that's uh, the method you see as appropriate. Uh, and uh, then the second chunk of the code. Uh, gives uh, the imputation itself. We always uh, uh, recommend checking uh, the locked events because uh, this might uh, give you an overview of some uh, problems uh, in, in the imputation. What is the most important uh, part here is that according to recommendations, uh, each treatment arm uh, should be imputed separately. So we solve this uh, by uh, uh, stratifying our data by treatment arm in one list, then you can use one command with one prediction matrix with one method to impute both lists, both treatment arms or more of treatment arms separately. Okay, so in the next step, uh, we use uh, package system fit to fit seemingly unrelated regression that accounts for possible correlation in costs and effects. Here you see again that uh, we adjust for the personal characteristics and uh, baseline value for uh, both costs uh, and effects. And uh, the beta coefficients of interests, uh, interest are those uh, for the treatment uh, uh, arm allocation. And this basically tells us what is the difference uh, between uh, the treatment arms uh, that we can account to uh, treatment allocation. And that's what we need uh, to calculate ICER and uh, possibly uh, other statistics. Uh, on this slide, I also go a little a bit further and uh, I show how to uh, calculate confidence uh, interval uh, using Rubin's rules for effects. For costs, I will show that uh, on the next slide uh, using bootstrapping because uh, costs are high, highly skewed and they are not recommended to be uh, calculated using Rubin's rules. Okay, so bootstrapping uh, is uh, generally, or it generally helps uh, us to evaluate uh, uncertainty. And uh, as mentioned also to obtain confidence intervals, uh, usually for costs, but uh, well, sometimes also for effects. It depends on uh, what uh, effects uh, you work with. And in principle, uh, it works uh, in a similar way. We see in the uh, top part of the slide a function uh, specifying that within each bootstrap sample, we want to obtain seemingly unrelated regression results. So here for each imputed uh, data set, and we have uh, five imputed data sets here, uh, we bootstrapped 5,000 uh, samples. So in total, we have 25,000 ICERs to be used to represent uncertainty. Uh, in the bottom part of the slide, 
you see uh, that to obtain confidence uh, intervals for costs, we uh, simply pull upper and lower limits uh, obtained from the bias corrected and accelerated uh, bootstrapping. And uh, the last part uh, to present the results, uh, well, uh, we calculate ICER, but again, in principle, uh, there's no problem to calculate any other statistics such as net monetary benefit, for instance. And the second part of uh, the code uh, gives the share of bootstrap samples in each quadrant of cost effectiveness plane. Uh, so this resulting cost effectiveness plane shows us that uh, this treatment is uh, not cost effective and yeah, that is further confirmed with uh, the cost uh, effectiveness acceptability curve. So this is the end uh, of uh, my presentation and I'm of course available for questions and also suggestions how from your perspective as uh, HTA, uh, well, professional or people working in the field, you would uh, push uh, this work further to be uh, useful also, for instance, to, to your colleagues or in your practice. Thank you. So thanks very much, Hannah, uh, for giving us the concluding presentation. Um, I can see that there's a very, very constructive approach by what you've done there. Um, sometimes it feels a bit uncomfortable pointing out what has been done wrong in the existing literature, but to go ahead and make a guide to instruct those who you know, maybe aren't familiar enough how to better uh, conduct their analysis, I think is a very positive way of doing it, but then to go a step further and actually to have the R tool that allows people the, the tools they need to, uh, to actually assess uh, the state of their, their data and so on really seems a very, very positive approach uh, behind that. Did this take a lot of planning to think of what the tool needed, or was that very much evident from the existing work of the kind of the, the guide in terms of better trial-based cost-effectiveness analysis? Yeah, well, um, well, it was kind of a uh, process. I think that uh, well, I, I joined the group about a year and a half ago. But uh, there was already this substantial four-year project of the colleague of mine who recently graduated yesterday uh, with his PhD. And uh, his work was basically a reaction to the fact that uh, there wasn't that uh, much guidance. And even though people uh, working in the field and specifically in the group that specializes most of the people to trial-based economic evaluation saw these gaps. So they kind of decided to run this four-year uh, project to address uh, the gaps. And at the same time, when I came, I was used to uh, to quote my uh, models in R. So I was like, yeah, let's perhaps translate the code we have now in Stata and for every trial-based economic evaluation, we use basically and adapt the same code. Let's do it in R because it's uh, much uh, more flexible, faster, etc. So that's uh, how the uh, idea uh, appeared. And it, it's really pretty much a work in progress because uh, as I said, the raw data uh, for trial-based economic evaluation is usually quite complex and there are many small subtasks to do. So we went from this complex uh, uh, task to the simplest one. And now we are going back, we try to identify the chunks uh, that we need to add, for instance, to show how to uh, impute on a much lower level than I showed today, etc. So we are trying to find out the balance and it's kind of a pet project for us. The, uh, the biggest added value I think could be in the fact that we will first explain the theory and then show a worked example how to, how to do this. So there could still be quite a bit of work in, in thinking how to get beyond the general to the um... To the more nitty gritty uh, though. Um, okay, I also I, I suppose I, it sounded like you had quite willing colleagues, um, you know, when you came to them with your R experience, they didn't need a lot of persuading, is that right? So, sorry, I couldn't hear you now. So you, you, uh, your colleagues were quite willing, so when you came with your R experience to say we can do an implementation of this in R, they, that they said okay, yeah, no problem, that's yeah, I think that it's similar from what we heard today that it's uh, where the field is uh, directing anyway. So 
uh, they were quite quite willing to do so because that's what you need to stay on yeah the kind of cutting edge of what's going on in the field we have a um we also have a question from from uh, Nailin, uh in the in the in the comments Nailin, do you want to unmute yourself and ask the question directly yes sir um, Ma'am, actually, like, uh, since a sure model is a system of equations, we have this contemporaneous correlation in this, right? This variance and covariance matrix. So uh, we have the correlation between the effect and the treatment. So how do you justify uh, through this trial-based models? Yeah, well, uh, if I understand uh, your question correctly, uh, what the answer is that basically we need to account for the fact that our costs and effects uh, are uh, correlated and for that reason we need uh, seemingly unrelated regression because it's uh, quite uh, usual that for instance people who have uh, low qualities have the highest costs uh, because uh, they need the most treatment or perhaps people who uh, have uh, highest cost uh, got the best treatment and they might also have uh, higher qualities. But uh, in any case, uh, we need to account for the fact that the costs and qualities are, uh, or costs and other effects are correlated. And yeah, that's recommended doing uh, yeah, the system uh, or the seemingly unrelated regressions. Okay, thank you. Okay. So do we have any other further questions? Yeah, I just also want to uh, acknowledge because I see that someone asks uh, about the code. Uh, it's it's available. I will uh, send uh, yeah, an updated version because I found some typos. Uh, so the one that is on, on GitHub isn't 100% correct. But uh, well, it, it's a code that is really adapted from uh, the tools that already exist. So we adapted it for our purposes, but we can't claim that it's our code from A, A to Z. And I always want to stress this because it wasn't our intention and we want to steal and not acknowledge the uh, yeah, work of uh, other people. And we often don't know who is behind some pieces of the code that we somehow found or adapted, so. Super, well, thanks very much. It's always yeah, uh, wise to make sure that the attribution is, uh, is, uh, is complete. Okay, well, um, uh, if there's, are there any further questions? Otherwise, I will move to closing the, uh, the session. Thanks a lot, Hannah.